get smart. That's what we're here to do, right? Um, so the next session is um, is exactly what, uh, what Joe alluded to this morning, which was one of the one of the big issues, which is around regulation and how that kind of fits into the greater product development um, of you know whether it be medical devices, services, apps, the whole kit and caboodle. So um, we've assembled an incredible. Um, seriously incredible group here to, to talk about this. I want to introduce uh, uh, Mark Sullivan, a writer at VentureBeat, and um, a little fun fact about Mark. He worked for a company during the 90s that sold electronic medical record software. Remember, in the, in the 90s. It was a pretty hard sell back then. <laughs> in fact, many of the doctors and medical officer, office workers would groan at the mere mention of EHR as it would involve reinventing all their workflows. I, and I would imagine that persisted for many years, so thank you. All right. Is my mic on? Can you hear me okay? Sounds like I am. Um, I'm excited about this discussion. We've uh, got some uh, good brain power up here on this. Um, this is Brad Thompson. He uh, works at the law firm of Epstein, Becker, and Green in D.C. He actually lives in uh, Indiana, and your office furniture is in D.C. Your bed is in Indiana. <laughs> and he works with companies on uh, regulatory issues. Uh, and uh, also we have Ad Adrian Petrie. A Aiden Petrie, sorry about that. Um, your chief information officer is iMedica. Innovation officer, sorry about that. And um, you're a contractor that uh, works with uh, medical device companies, and you sort of help them through the design, planning, and manufacture. Is that correct? We, we take companies from concept through the FDA to build. Concept through the FDA. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, Aiden, the, the first question is, uh, sort of for you, and uh, Brad, you can chime in afterward. Uh, just in a general sense, uh, talking about uh, digital health startups, um, what are some of the uh, things that you might say if, if a startup is, is looking for a place to play in, in the healthcare? They, they, they want to come in, they want to make a difference, address a health point, but they also want to make a viable business that makes money. What, what are some of the things they ought to be thinking about? Um, I, I think for the most part is there, there is no end, there is no shortage of things that one can do to improve health and health care, both in this country and, uh, and, and globally in different ways. Um, but earlier on, the low-hanging fruit was mentioned, and there is an inordinate amount of low-hanging fruit. And so the thing that I think one needs to look for is where the sig significant waste can be uh, mitigated. So, this, if, and in, in hospital currency, that might be time. If you can s um, speed something up through a rapid diagnostic, then you can you can uh, facilitate a more efficient system without and, and better workflows. So, I th so I think the most successful um, opportunities that we see are ones where there is a um, there is waste that can be identified with a dollar sign attached to it, and that can go in, in multiple different ways. Interesting. Um, can I can I yeah. chime in on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I I agree wholeheartedly that there is low hanging fruit, and uh, from the MBA in me would would always want to go for that. Um, part of what I heard in the question is you were looking for meaningful opportunities, and and that I. I I assume you mean both long-term opportunities that have a real impact. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all have our own stories. I'm, I'm 53, and uh, several years ago, I already had a touch of skin cancer. I had to have the top of my ear uh, removed. And personally, I think early disease detection um, is, one of the, is one of the areas where mobile uh, stands the greatest opportunity to have an enormous impact on people's lives and where uh, there's all sorts of, of open space right now because people aren't, aren't going into that territory. Um, you know, I, it took a lot for me to go to a, the dermatologist. My wife was on me. She's a registered nurse. She said, you need to have that looked at. I finally did, and yeah, sure enough, it was something wrong. That was five years ago, and, and I don't want to go back. 
And so if there were an app, obviously, that I could use uh, to look at, at potential, you know, lesions on the skin and say, is that just a, a pimple or is that something I need to worry about? To me, that has real value to be able to use, deploy those sorts of technologies into people's hands and, and save lives. So I agree with the low-hanging fruit, but I think there's also stuff at the, at the high end. And, I, and I'm bound to, to uh, just build on that in that yesterday we did a workshop um, uh, as, as part of the conference, and I did it with a company who has um, a, a device uh, and a system that recognizes, uh, that diagnoses melanomas. And uh, we've looked as a company at that particular uh, people coming in with devices that do that, apps that do that, probably seven or eight times in the last five years. This is the first one, I have to do a little shout out to them, uh, Three Derm, um, the, the, who focused, they understood how the healthcare system worked such that they could slot their, their app in as um, into, the, into the value stream of, of how, um, in their case, ACOs work. So it, it, you sort of, it, it's, the app can do something, but you've got, then got to align it where, where will that work within the, the strange way that the, the healthcare system uh, money flow works. Right. It's, it's higher value, but with that, it's also higher complexity, higher cost, and hopefully one day higher return. Yeah. Well, some of this is, is simple. I mean, it's the pain points, the, the parts of healthcare that are costing us the most in this country are fairly easily identifiable. I, I'm seeing a lot of work done on, for instance, uh, 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 apps that monitor glucose or, uh, you know, there's, there's communication apps for uh, congestive heart failure, people that often end up returning to the hospital because they don't follow their order. So some of this is, I mean, maybe that is the low-hanging fruit, those, those type of things. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's low-hanging fruit. That stuff still has to be done right, and, and um, uh, there is some complexity in that. But there's huge value. There's huge upside uh, in that. The dollars that you're talking about in those cases to the Medicare uh, system and to private payers, that's, that's huge. So if you can move the needle even just a little bit there uh, and capture some of that value, I, I think you can do quite well. Um, one more question along these lines. Uh, mistakes that young companies make, uh, strategic mis mistakes early on. Um, what, what, what are you seeing? What are some of the ones that, that you see most often? Um, if, if the word Kickstarter and, <laughs> and product development are used in the same sentence, <laughs> that I have a, then that would be an alarm bell. Um, the, um, Oftentimes, companies come to us in different ways. A lot of times it is with a technology, and um, the, the technology is one component. There has to be an enabling technology, typically, in allowing something to happen, but there also has to be that market component and that user component, and they, and they have to come together. So we have seen a, a, a bunch of times where a cool technology doesn't really have, is, a, a market behind it that, or, a, or a clinical need that's particularly valuable. So cool technologies of themselves don't get it done. And then the, the, the other thing that I'd say is a common uh, issue is not understanding fully what the road ahead looks like. So in, in I mean, I used to work in, in consumer products for a long time, and you've sort of, you more or less got to market. In, in the case of, of um, FDA regulated products, there is a process that you, you're gonna go through, and that has implications on resources and funding and value milestones and so forth. And so it, that, that there is, a, I would say, a very steep learning curve oftentimes to just un knowing what you're gonna have to do to get to that finish line. So. You see products that are cool but not useful. I was, I think I saw one of those products up in Seattle yesterday, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, let's jump into the regulatory stuff. Brad, did you have something you wanted to add? Okay. All right. Um, the FDA issued an advisory, was it last September, I believe it was? Um, and there were some guidelines set forth there about uh, 
what apps have to do and comply with apps and devices. But a lot of people thought that there was some gray area left even after that. And uh, Brad, why don't you tell me what, what those might be? Well, there's at least three uh, gray areas that FDA has promised that they'll work on by the end of this fiscal year. And this fiscal year ends September 30, so it's not that far away. Uh, but we're expecting additional guidance from FDA, uh, number one, on the difference between wellness and disease. Um, FDA's reach goes to those things which, which diagnose or treat disease. But there are a lot of people who want to develop apps that are really more fundamentally uh, focused on keeping you well than they are addressing disease. But the line can get blurry. A few years ago, the chairman of the board of General Mills received a warning letter from FDA saying, you're selling a new drug, Cheerios. And, and, and the reason FDA said Cheerios was a drug is that on the box, uh, uh, General Mills was making claims about reduced cholesterol. And reducing cholesterol is a disease-related claim, and so FDA said you need to file a new drug application. Um, so the difference between wellness and, and disease. In the mobile app space, for example, one area that I think would be very useful, and I hope FDA would allow it without regulating, would be if you had an app that had um, maybe a question and answer about the risk factors for diabetes. Um, does your mother have it? Does your father have it? All the different things that might suggest whether you're going to have diabetes. And then at the end, it may give you a prognosis and then suggest maybe you want to alter your life, shed a few pounds, Brad, don't have that third chocolate eclair, that sort of thing. Um, to me, that would be very useful. But if right now in the current environment, if it said this is a way to see if you might be at risk for diabetes or, or congestive heart failure or whatever, there's a chance that it would be regulated. And I think FDA needs to clarify and say, no, we're not going to regulate that sort of thing. The second area that they've uh, said they'll clarify is accessories. The, the September guidance only addressed software. The app that sits on the cell phone, it didn't address any of the hardware or the peripheral items. That's the next step. FDA has to explain when those peripheral items get regulated. For example, um, a simple uh, cable that might have a USB port on one end and the Apple proprietary uh, connector on the other end. Uh, if you promote that for connecting a blood glucose meter to a cell phone, you've arguably made it into a medical device because it plugs into a medical device. In the old days, that made something a medical device. That doesn't make sense anymore, and we want FDA to clarify and, frankly, narrow the scope of what it regulates. The third is clinical decision support software, and this is a really growing area of mobile apps. Software which analyzes data that maybe you supply, maybe you type it in, maybe it's in an electronic health record, wherever it might be. If the data uh, basically does two things, it gives you a patient-specific or person-specific recommended action it would be characterized as clinical decision support software, CDS. Um, FDA has said they plan to regulate the highest risk forms of CDS. Um, right now, the examples they would give is you have software that might look at a uh, mammography image and help a radiologist see where the hot spots are on the image where the radiologist ought to look for potential cancer. It's just algorithms. It's just looking at a medical image and saying to the doctor, look here. That's regulated. In fact, it's regulated among the highest risk uh, devices at FDA, even though it's just software that might sit on a PC or, or on a tablet or something. So that stuff's going to get regulated. At the low end, you have something that, that does an APCAR score, all right? Adds five numbers together between zero and two. Literally, that's a medical device. FDA has said, too low risk, we're not going to bother with it. That would be silly. But somewhere in the middle, they're going to draw a line. For example, um, uh, drug uh, dosing calculators. Sometimes those are proprietary, they're very complicated, and if you get it wrong, if there's a mistake in the coding or whatever, it leads to a wrong dose. We want to see, is FDA going to regulate drug dosing calculators? Those are the three areas that we're hoping that FDA uh, uh, puts out guidance by the end of uh, September. In general, the end goal here is to make sure that uh, products that uh, predict or diagnose uh, are, are regulated, and, and ones that just uh, react to a, a measurement and then present you with some sort of information, uh, maybe those don't need to be regulated. Well, uh, one of the differences is between, you know, a specific uh, recommendation for a specific person, Brad, you have a migraine, 
versus Google, which just says, here's a bunch of things that we searched for and found that might be relevant and you might want to read. Yeah. On that end, clearly not regulated. On the Brad, you have a migraine, um, potentially regulated. What Brad said about uh, the guidelines from September not covering hardware, uh, that seems like something that would cause me a lot of anxiety if I were a, a, a young company. Uh, are, are, are you seeing that? Is that true? Um, I, I think there's, there, there is, yes, there's um, anxiety and guidelines um, get acted on at different um, they, they get enforced at, at different levels at different times. Um, we have we are obliged to to advise our clients about what we think is coming, what 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 a good guideline is. Um, if the guideline's there, at some point it's going to be enforced. So it's sort of telling you you need to be moving this particular direction. So the, these gray areas, um, th th there is advice that that Brad gives that is probably fairly predictive as to this is likely what, what is going to happen, but there are certainly gray areas there. Um, the, the value of saying, I'm going to wax conservative here and, 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 and stay on the side to say this probably might be, um, this is likely to be regulated, is um, a consideration that companies uh, should take. So um, it, 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 is, it is certainly at this point, it's fair to say it's foolhardy to ignore guidelines. Uh, companies at the stages that you are uh, are working with them, um, uh, do are they calling in consultants and people to advise them on the, these types of things, or is, is it something they are supposed to know? I, I think they would. It would be a big mistake if they attempted to go it alone. There is too much to learn, and unless they they've got a very very long view, there is too much to learn and, and to bring in consultants is the right thing to do. Because the, 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 there are new guidelines, there's not just the, the FDA, there, is, there are guidances coming out of, out of Europe, there are guidances you want to go be global. So you have to have some level of, of consultant um, feeding information to you and, and directing uh, where you put your energy. At the end of the day, most of the times you're working with a technology company, those guys should work on the technologies. The, 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 the guidances are just giving you some uh, parameters by which to develop. Well, we, we, we're kind of into this question about um, how does a young company move in, in you know, a situation of regulatory uncertainty. And I, uh, I think in the main, you, you, you've answered that, err, be conservative and, and get help. Uh, anything to add to that? Well, I, I, I'd add two things to that. Um, the first is that there are fairly low-cost ways to hedge your bets. Uh, and that's what most business people do in an era of uncertainty is a little bit of hedging. So how would you hedge? Um, if you're making an app and you're in the gray area, if you're, if you're in clearly unregulated, you don't have to worry about it. If you're in clearly regulated, you, you, you don't have to worry about it. If you're in this area in the middle that's somewhat gray, a way to hedge your bet is to adopt a quality system when you're just starting off. And the reason I say that is um, quality systems are really hard to retrofit. If two years later you, you realize that your product should have been developed under a quality system, you have to go back and reinvent all sorts of wheels. It's a pain, it's expensive, it's disruptive. Um, and, and actually the cost of implementing a quality system is, it depends on your size. If you're small, if you're a three or four person shop, it's pretty nominal. Because you have very few people you have to train, um, you, you can basically go out and get some forms and use them. The main uh, issue is documentation, and, and these are IT companies, right? They're good at documentation. So putting a quality system in place early can be very inexpensive, much less expensive than if you do it here when it's finally determined. The other thing, and I think you're probably saying the same thing, is, is be vigilant, be watchful, because Washington doesn't move that quickly. They, they give signals in advance before they do things. And so if you're watching, if you're paying attention, you will know fairly far in advance before there's a major change. It won't just sneak up on you and get you. I'm curious to know what, what these signals look like. I mean, what's an example? Well, the, the boring but most reliable is the Federal Register, right? It's a, it's a publication of where they, they state their intention to do certain things. So for example, 
you would have known what I said about the three guidances if you, if you read the Federal Register last October when it was published and, and said that those were three guidances that they were working on. But that's not the only place, right? If you read the trade literature, there's specialized literature in this space that would, that would share that kind of thing, where they read the Federal Register for you. I don't want to hawk some particular uh, brand, but, but there are all sorts of um, specialized medical technology journals that would report on that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to get, get into the question now, uh, and we've discussed this a little bit before, about um, FDA uh, compliance while during the, the, the product development cycle. And, um, you know, some companies look, look at this as, uh, you know, another thing that has to be done and uh, uh, perhaps a, a hindrance uh, a that costs resources. But, uh, Aiden, I know you believe that there's some real upside to, to following these things from, from the start. Sure, on the, on the, the device um, development side, so I, I went to art school, so regulations were not the top of my list at, at, at art school. Um, what, as, as the company has, has grown and developed, um, we adopted, we, we registered our company with the FDA, so we're ISO certified and, and uh, FDA registered. The, um, and what comes with that is a, a system that anybody who is going to have a medical device used upon them would say, well, that's a pretty good system. Um, because it is assuring the, 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 the quality of the design, the efficacy of the design, the quality, the quality of the manufacturing, and really how something is done. So a quality system advises, it, it, regulations aren't, it shouldn't be viewed as barriers. They're, they're, they're quite um, thoughtful guidelines as to how you, um, put, uh, put, develop a product. And what it's done for us uh, as a company and the sorts of startups that come to us who tend to fold, they'll, they'll use our, uh, our uh, quality system and they'll fold under that. Um, it allows you to be much more consistent in, in your ability to deliver work. So in, in a way, if the, the more you know, the, the, the thought behind developing those guidelines and the, and the quality systems, is, is generally speaking very good practice for de developing a product. There is, um, there is more documentation than, um, than developing something outside of the guidelines, but um, that is part of, of traceability and that's a part of our responsibility to demonstrate that we've done something, something properly. So um, we've actually, ha having left art school, I I'm, I'm now would say that having a, a decent, some level of quality system at the appropriate level for any company in development is, the, is a good thing to do because you know where you are in time and space and you're checking the boxes. And the worst thing, if any, anybody's in the developing products, the worst thing you can ever do in developing a product is go into reverse. It gets, product development gets more and more and more costly as it goes forward. So to, to find you've got to go back and, and fill in, in right. something is incredibly expensive. Right. So having this in mind every step of the way is, is more efficient and can prevent, prevent that, I would imagine. Yes, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the, if you look at an ISO um, uh, quality system, the components that they lay out, and you say, okay, we know now uh, what we've got to do, we now know what we've got to do, um, and when we've got to do it, those parts are in place. So it's a little bit of a playbook um, that, uh, as to how you develop something. It's, it's um, so it, it, it's mainly costing you in, in time. I mean, doing the documentation takes, takes man hours to do. Is it, uh, uh, you know, is it, how, how burdensome is it? On devices, it can, it can be pretty, it, it's time and money. Um, and the, 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 because you have to verify so many things, when you take a device through, so something that is um, uh, reading a, uh, your, your heart rate or something, um, you, you've, you've got to demonstrate all the way through development that it's been safe to develop. So when you've gone out and done trials that they've been conducted safely, when you've um, when you've, you're manufacturing it, that your processes have been validated. So there, there, there is, 
the, you can design something well, but you've also got to manufacture it well. Manif and that means there, there, there are layer upon layer. You've got to know where the materials come from. You've got to have traceability. Well, just a, 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 a fairly significant amount of, of steps you have to take. But if you take them and you fold them in as, as you go, it is, I mean, I, I would say, I always think it's probably about three times as expensive as if you were developing something um, without. But you're, you're much more assured of the process. And it's worth, I think it's worth people knowing, being familiar with the, the intent of, of the guidelines. Right. Three times as much to develop. That's, that's impressive. Uh, Brad, you're an industry lawyer, and yet you say that you're uh, for more enforcement, more FDA enforcement. That, uh, explain that to me. Uh, well, there's, a, there's context that's important to that. I've published a couple of articles asking FDA for more even-handed enforcement. And, and the reason is simply we, we find ourselves in a strange political environment where FDA uh, is not willing to back away from the requirements that it imposes, uh, but at the same time is not enforcing many of those requirements. And um, that is a real problem uh, for ethical companies that want to get into this space because they can either join the unethical ones and cut the corners in order to meet the same price points as, as the others who are doing it, or they can stay out of it. And, and neither one of those options is a good option. Um, FDA has been uh, beat up by Congress and by a lot of folks, and a lot of it is deserved, no question about it. Some of it is not deserved. Um, but they are gun shy around enforcing, and um, it, it creates an unlevel playing field. And I don't care which end you go. Uh, if you want to get rid of the regulatory requirements, that's fine with me. Um, if you want to enforce the regulatory requirements even-handedly, that would be uh, that would be fairer than just saying here are the regulatory requirements, but we're going to look the other way and let people um, uh, let people selectively violate them. Um, there are ways that they could uh, level that pretty easily by sending a very benign letter to folks who are not complying, just pointing out that fact and asking them to come into compliance. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll actually start doing that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, uh, what, what you just said, Aiden, about uh, the differences in cost of developing a product when you're in compliance or not, is, that's, a, that's a, uh, a big gap there. So this issue of the level playing field, um, you know, if I'm a company that's in that gray area and I'm, I have to be competitive, <laughs> it seems like it'd be real temptation to just uh, go it alone. There's a lot of value if, if, if you can make claims about a particular technology and because you can guide yourselves in some cases in those great areas to make to, to present the pro your product or your app in a certain way that's outside of the guidance. But if you can adhere, if you can make those claims and stand by them, there's an awful lot of value from a business point of view of being able to do that. So, you know, they, these are they're, they're, they're trade offs. Um, and there are many businesses that I think should probably make those claims come under FDA guidance um, because they be, they're then substantiated. And if Cheerios can't be proven to, to do whatever it was supposed to do, um, then you know, that's not a valid claim. Just one more thing I wanted to get to, if, if we have time, is that you, uh, you guys are telling me, you're describing to me about you know, compliance, and it's, it looks to me like a, a system of constraints. Um, I worry about not just the, 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 the costs and the time, but what does that do to just the spirit of, of innovation and, you know, freedom to, to think outside the box and things like that? Aiden. I went to art school. It's not going to affect me in any way. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that is a, I think that's a real red herring, I've got to say, and uh, I don't think it, in, uh, th there is a lot of value in in b having understanding what the constraints are. It's just saying that the football pitch is this size, this long, and the ball can only go so far. You know, it's. Yeah, I I don't want to be cavalier about it because unnecessary regulation is inefficient. It it increases cost and it delays product to market. So, so I don't want to be cavalier about it. At the same time. Uh, it is possible to innovate. I'm probably 10 years late in reading the book, uh, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, 
a, a, a business school professor about all the constraints if you want to sell to those who can't afford much. And the number of constraints are amazing. But the innovation that came out of trying to serve those markets helped everyone. So constraints are what lead to innovation. So the mere existence of a constraint doesn't mean innovation can't exist. At the same time, we don't want um, uh, senseless uh, constraints. They need to be appropriate. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much. I've learned a lot today, and uh, uh, that's, that's about it, I guess. Thank you. This is an important topic, and obviously a lot to debate about it still. So thank you very much. So we're in a round of applause for them. We